Between 1939 and 1945, a remarkable band of 168 women helped keep Britain in the war. They were pioneers in aviation and equality. I think we were extraordinarily lucky. The best part of my life, I'm sure, it was uh, fantastic. These trailblazers were part of the Air Transport Auxiliary, the ATA, a thousand-strong organization that delivered 300,000 aircraft to the frontline RAF during Britain's darkest hours. I just love to fly. I'd much rather be up in the air than down on the ground. Without them, the Battle of Britain might never have been won, and Britain's dominance in the air that paved the way for ultimate victory would never have been achieved. But their war wasn't all cramped cockpits and oily rags. If the RAF fighter pilots were the Hollywood stars of World War II, then these women were their leading ladies. No women in Britain in the war were more admired for doing their bit or for their uniform than the women of the ATA. Whether they liked it or not, they were the glamour girls of the war. We had lots of boyfriends because at that time we were called the glamour girls. I don't know why, but there were always plenty of escorts around. If um, anybody pinched my behind, I was only thankful I was attractive enough to have my bottom pinched. But the pressure of keeping the RAF supplied with planes made it one of the most dangerous jobs in the war. The only time I frightened myself out of my wits was coming face to face with one of the Cotswold Hills. They didn't just need bags of courage to fly. They faced a constant struggle for recognition. I landed to pick him up, and he said, I never fly with the women. Get out, you know, I'm going to fly this airport. But their determination shone through, and they finally won the ultimate aviation prize of World War II. They flew the Spitfire. They could go up and play with the clouds, you know, and have great fun. It was so light, it was so with you, you were part of it. It was wonderful. Some of them look quite young, don't they? <laughs> But they wear, <laughs> and that's why they look quite young. <laughs> At a Cotswolds country house, an elite group of ladies in their 80s have come together to discuss old times. They have one thing in common. They were all aviation pioneers. In World War II, they flew for the Air Transport Auxiliary, the ATA, delivering aircraft from factory to the RAF. And from a very early age, they needed no encouragement to fly. I was always saving up to try and go up and fly, and I was always going to have a lucrative job, I don't know what at, make lots of money and learn to fly, you see. Did you take all these with your camera? No my idea. I always wanted to fly. I nearly broke my neck twice jumping off a fence following a bird. <laughs> In the 1920s, flying became something anyone who was rich and male could do. When women weren't supposed to venture out of the kitchen, one woman was to be their inspiration. Amy Johnson was Britain's pioneering aviatrix. She would also become an ATA girl in the war. It started in 1930 with this extraordinary flight from Croydon to Darwin, Australia in 12 days flat by a woman nobody had ever heard of. By the time she got to Darwin on Empire Day, there was a huge crowd to welcome her. She was a megastar for life. She's been described as the, the posh, as in Bex, of her time. And that just about sums up the extraordinary vortex of fame that descended on her. It was the start of flying as a fashionable pursuit for the rest of the 30s. Amy Johnson inspired the women aviators, but it was defying gravity for the first time that hooked Freydis Charland when she was just 10 years old. My brother, Derek, who was up at Trinity College, Cambridge, rang me up one day and said there was an air display near us. Would I like to go? And then he contacted my father, who gave us each 10 shillings. 
because he presumed we'd want to go in a flight, which hadn't entered my head, but anyway, there it was. It was a demonstration flight, they told us, which meant that we demonstrated all sorts of aerobatics. And um, after the first lot of flick rolls, my brother managed to strap me in, and we did all sorts of different aerobatics. And at the end of it, we did a great side slip down to the ground and landed. And when I got out, I said to Derek, he said, I said, if there's a war, that's what I'd like to do. Molly Rose fell so in love with flying, she took a job as an aircraft engineer after finishing school in Paris. It helped that her father owned the Marshall Engineering and Aviation Empire. I was the only woman working on the hangar floor, and I have to say that the chaps were extraordinarily kind to me. If I got stuck with a, a, a jolly old nut, I couldn't get off. You know, there was usually someone around that you would say help, and they would come and do it for you. I was bent double over, the, over a cockpit, rewiring this tiger moth, and um, suddenly I had a, a, a tip over the bow hind, and um, so I sort of gradually got myself out of this and looked around and there wasn't anyone to be seen, and so I just roared with laughter and went back into the, into the cockpit. If I'd been very prim about it, then I think they would have discarded me. But as it was, you know, I was happy to work with them and they were happy to work with me ruined my hands for life, but apart from that, it was fine. But it wasn't all chapped hands and tight nuts. If you were well off, the thing to do was buy a plane of your own. Flying was uh, the skiing of the interwar period for the very wealthy. At the controls of a plane, they could go to the Magyar pilots' picnic in Budapest, could be in Berlin for lunch, they could be entertained in Stockholm in the afternoon, and. Uh, as, as Gordon uh, Selfridge, the department store heir, told Rosemary Reese, you just won't have any fun without a plane. Wendy Sale Barker learned to fly so that she could travel to South Africa with a friend for Christmas and ski in the Alps in the same season. They ran into a tremendous storm uh, outside Mount Kilimanjaro and uh, they crashed into the bush. The girls were missing and believed to have come down in lion infested territory but she wrote a message in lipstick and a Maasai warrior took this message to the British commissioner and help was sent and this is uh, the actual message please come and fetch us we have had an air crash and are hurt and it's signed Sale Barker and Page which were their surnames uh, in fact, Audrey Sale Barker was her real name, but she was always nicknamed Wendy because in Peter Pan, Wendy had flown away, and somehow that nickname always stuck. Wendy went on to become one of the first ATA girls. She also captained the British women's skiing team at the 1936 Olympics. It was here that another future ATA girl witnessed what Nazi Germany was like. Freda Scharlen's father won a gold medal for sailing at Kiel on the Baltic coast. My mother and I and my brother, Derek, were taken out each day in a tug or something to follow the racing, which was very exciting. One place we saw three U-boats launched in one day. We thought that surely nobody would be so stupid as to start another war, having been brought up, you know, just after the f First World War. We could see the devastation and the awful mourning of all the people who'd lost the thing. Hitler came over one day to Kiel, and there was this enormous crowd to greet him.